Welcome to the Even Better Podcast, Welcome where your host, Sinica Waugh of Your Clear Sinica Next Step, host, brings you exciting content about so making communities better by this helping people get even better at work. Next step to help us all have even better work days so that together we can co-create better communities. And I am delighted to welcome my friend and colleague, Ann Stow. Ann, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me, Seneca. I am super excited to be part of my very first podcast. Oh, oh goodness. I am so glad to be hosting your very first podcast. This is this is so much fun. So for those of you who are listening today, if you don't know Anne, it is time to get to know Anne. She is, bar none, the most enthusiastic person I know. And that, my friends, is saying a lot because I try to surround myself with enthusiastic people. But let me tell you a little bit about Anne. Gosh, Anne and I have known each other for more years than either one of us is going to count. So we're not going to count the years. But Anne Stout, and the first time I saw it, I'm like, wait, Anne Stuff? Well, it's spelled like tough, but it rhymes with cow. So Anne Stow, she is a CBAP, a CBAP. She is a credentialed advisor level business analyst with 17 years experience in business analysis, 14 in healthcare information technology, and three in facility infrastructure technology. So all of that sounds like a technical professional, right? And it sounds like someone who for those of you who don't know any better, you might think, wow, well, this person must be very serious. <laughs> this person must be really, really focused, yes, and serious when she needs to, sure. But this person, Anne Stow, shows this unbridled enthusiasm when the moment calls for it. And one of the first encounters that I had with Anne was one of those moments when we're together at an IIBA event somewhere. And her name got called for a drawing. She was a door prize or a drawing winning. And she won. And she goes, Woo! in this way that she stands up and throws her arms up and sets the bar for the rest of the event. And so everyone knew that from that moment forward, if you won the prize, whatever it was, whether it was a, a book or a t-shirt or a, a, a piece of swag from any of the vendor booths, whatever it was, Ann Stow had now set the bar that this was the level of enthusiasm that one must show because, because this is it, right? And this was setting the tone for the entire day. And it was amazing. And I knew at that moment that Anne and I would be forever friends. Oh, Anne. That was <laughs> I'm so glad. So here. fun. That was <laughs> such a fun day. It was, it was. And you did not begin in software development, but we, we stumbled, we met each other in the IIBA chapter and you volunteered and you've been part of chapter leadership for many years and volunteerism for many years. We, we met as business analysts or in the central Iowa IIBA chapter, but that's, that's not where you got your start, right? Correct. Yeah. No, I didn't get my start in software development or as a business analyst. So who 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 knows when they're eight years old and you ask a kid, what what do you want to do when I grow up? I want to be a business analyst. You know, that <laughs> just never really <laughs> rolls off the tongue. In my case, I started out with uh, computer hardware and found some areas that that really stuck with me that was exciting. So I moved from hardware into database interests and and learning about data. I found that's really what moves the world is is information, right? That you get from the database. And so the best way to design or use the database or to get information back out of it is to know what you want. And that was a great segue into dun, 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 the world of business analysis, which I dearly love now. Yeah, for sure. And then you loved it so much that you went on and became you became a credentialed CBAP. I mean, you you took the exam back in the day when it was still I mean, it, it is it is one of the most rigorous exams out there. And that is that is no small feat. And you took it in the early days before there were some tools to help us prepare. <laughs> like the, the youngins today have no idea. But oh, no idea. Yeah, I had to make my own flashcards, Seneca. Who does that these days? It's all online in an app. But yes, I decided that when I got into software development, that I really wanted to understand quickly what business analysis and software development looks like instead of in an, in an infrastructure sort of world that I'd been used to. And so I used our Central Iowa chapter of the IIBA to 
to jump in with both feet. So I started going to monthly meetings and meeting people and networking and volunteering for iPads just so that I could get that knowledge. And in a short period of time, I don't know, six months or so, it was enough that like, okay, this is really what I want to do and to be good at it and to serve my company better. Talking about business analysis and why I became a CBAP. So we'd mentioned that I took my test in the dark ages with version two and had to make my own flashcards and a study guide. And I did it at my kitchen table and it took me six weeks of studying and a whole lot of blood, sweat and tears. But I did get my CBAP on the very first try and it was so grueling that I never wanted to set for it again. So it doesn't matter what happens. I am doing my CDUs without fail because I never wanted to take that test again. It was <laughs> something. But the best thing, well, I don't know if it's the best thing, but one really good thing about sitting for the CBAP is that because I'd had enough experience, it occurred to me that the language used in the BA box that supports the test are all things that I'd done. It was just different terminology than what I used in my workforce. So once I got that mindset, then all of the concepts were there and I probably sweated a whole lot more than I needed to, but I'm happy to have it. That's for sure. Well, I bet, I bet. And I, I think about the, the volunteerism that you've done and the, the other things that I've, I've seen you involved in, in IIBA, but I want to, I want to pause for a second, because you said something really, really interesting. And I, I hope this comes through. I know we had a, a little sound gap for a second there, but you said, this is something you did for the good of your company. And I just want to pause right there, because I think that has been one of the things that has struck me about you is, is not only, and are you consistently good at making authentic human connection with the people around you, but I have seen you consistently also find ways as a business analyst. And when you're serving the IIBA to, to put the good of the organization that you're serving at the forefront. And even when you were working on your, your CBAP, you were thinking about, yes, how, how is this good for me? Obviously, this, this had to be good for Anne. It had to be something that you were doing to put your own career forward. But you were also thinking about how this was going to be good for the organization that you were a part of at that time. And I just, I just have to, to just praise you for that and compliment you for that because it's, it's just really, really lovely to see that in action. Oh, thanks. I think a lot of people by nature just you, you want to do a good job. It's really hard to be the new kid on the block right? And walk into an environment that maybe you don't know everything and you haven't been there before and everybody around you seems to speak in acronyms. And in, in order to be effective in your team, you can be a wallflower or you can learn. And I chose to learn. Let's that. make my team effective. So let's do it. Well, okay. So let's talk about some of the other ways of when you're joining a team. So this is a good transition into the topic that you've selected today, five tips for making new connections. So whether you're making those new connections because you are uh, new to a team or, or perhaps there are other ways that you're making these new connections, but you've brought us today, five tips for making new connections. This is something you've sort of made a, made a habit out of, made a, an art, a science, a, a process, a habit for sure out of. So you've got five of these that you're bringing us today. And I understand you want to start with the fifth one. Okay. First off, why did you, why did you pick these five tips for making new connections? Let's, <laughs> let, let's talk about that. Why, why did you pick these five tips for making new connections? Why is this your topic today? I chose this topic about making new connections because actually it's not easy for me, believe it or not. I, I had to make it a growth opportunity for myself. And I've, I've learned that it's a necessary skill in every aspect of life. Yes, I, I want my team to be successful. I want my company to be successful. I want my household to be successful. I want what, whomever I talk to. And I want all of my interactions to be successful. And making new connections is a, is a big part of that. And it's really outside my comfort zone. So this was a great opportunity to think about why I make these new connections and, and how to make them fun. Nice. So I hope the audience is inspired, you know, to go out and make a new connection and see where it takes them. You just never know. You just never know. All right. So uh, you want to start these in reverse order. So we got five. We'll start with number five. And your first, well, your fifth tip is to go to an event of some sort. Okay. This seems like a good way to tell us more about this. Go to some event of some sort. What do you mean? How does that help us make connections? 
Well, just being around general public. So what a, what better way to practice making connections and seeing how really easy it is once you put a smallest amount of effort necessary and to watch something beautiful happen. So going to an event of some sort, you know, it makes me think of an example for me when my husband and I were season ticket holders to Kansas Speedway, and this is from 2001 and two, to 2007. So I don't know if you've ever watched racing, but race fans can be viciously loyal to their driver or their team. And so at the first race weekend of that very first season at Kansas Speedway, it was an IndyCar weekend. And there was a couple sitting behind us who commented on our our fancy connected headphones. My husband and I could talk to each other over all of the loud race sounds. And we had a wire that connected our or two headsets and a, and a push to talk mic and it it made the race enjoyable for us and they were they were very impressed with it so we told them all about our cool headsets and in doing so we noticed that the couple was decked out in tony stewart merchandise so at the time tony stewart was involved in indy cars as well as nascar and so that was a fun weekend the second race weekend of that very same season it was a NASCAR weekend, so a different style of car, but also Tony Stewart was there. And consequently, so were the couple behind us who were also season ticket holders. Well, my husband was a Jeff Gordon fan at the time, which does not mix well with Tony Stewart fans. Actually, Jeff Gordon fans don't mix with any other team, but <laughs> definitely not Tony Stewart. So we were all prepared to be booed and scoffed and on the receiving end of various forms of liquid spillage, whether it be water or beer or things get, <laughs> get spilled on you. But as part for the course, you know, we received a fair amount of snide comments from the Tony Stewart couple behind us. Well, guess what? Jeff Gordon won that race, which gave my husband ammunition to return the favor to the couple behind us. And so there was a fair amount of snide comments back to that. But at the end, we, we all wished each other well. So that was a fun weekend. Then the next year comes around, a whole year later, and at the first race weekend of the second year, the couple that, the Tony Stewart couple that was behind us, they were still in their same seats, which was nice because then we saw somebody that we knew, but most of the other people around us had changed. Having made that connection from the first year, we just chit-chatted and talked racing and weather and light topics that made waiting for the event more enjoyable. But from then on, we would hold each other's seats so random strangers wouldn't sit in them. We'd watch each other's stuff during restroom breaks and bring back snack bar items to save each other a trip. So that bit of comfort for the years that we held the tickets made the events all the more enjoyable because we made a connection. That's so fun. So how many years did you wind up having these friends? I mean, was it a couple, three, four years? Six years, actually. And by the end, we knew their names. We knew their, their grandkids' names. And when when we saw them again after a few months between the race weekends and then the subsequent year, it's just nice to see somebody that you know. And when you have that, when you have that connection with people, it just makes the event that much better. You know, just about any sort of event that you might go to. Perhaps another example would be I went to the West Des Moines Farmer's Market recently, and they have live music there after the Farmer's Market. And lo and behold, I saw my banker lady up dancing. How fun was that? So the next time I got to see her, then I, I had something to talk about with her. But it made our connection at the bank more fun because we all need more fun in our lives. And it gave us a better connection. So when I talk to her on the phone or see her in person, then I get great service. I love this. So, and you can't, you can't do that. You can't build on that. If you haven't gone to these events, if you've, if you've stayed inside, if you've, if you've just, you know, hold up in your own space and read your own books or, or, you know, stayed inside work at home, work at home, work at home, and you haven't gone to events, you haven't tried something new and, and tried to build up those connections, then you don't, then you don't have those opportunities. You've, you've missed them. All right. I, I see where you're going with that then. Okay. So in the interest of time, I'm going to keep us moving. So number four on your list, five tips for making new connections. I'm going to keep us moving. Number four is say hello to a stranger. My dad doesn't know any strangers. He only knows friends he hasn't met yet. So let's talk about say hello to a stranger. How does this work? 
Oh my goodness. So I chose this one, this as a tip for making new connection, because this part is actually the hardest for me. You mentioned staying inside, staying in your books. Well, yeah, I work remotely. I have since 2014. So connecting with humanity becomes a lost art. So that's why these connections are so important. Perhaps it's hardest for everyone, honestly. But when you do do it, it can manifest itself into an amazing day where karma rewards you. So be sure and smile when you do it. Say hello to a cashier. You know, they deal with far too many grouchy people. But they remember at the end of the day, people who smiled at them and looked them in the eye. Thank you. You know, just say thank you. Something. Just say hello to a stranger. The best Aww. part about this tip is that you don't even have to remember their name, which <laughs> I can't remember anybody's name. So... Just the smile and the personal touch will be what they remember, at least in my experience. I, I had read somewhere that the, and I don't, I don't remember my debater of a husband would say, make sure you cite your source on this one. And I can't, cause it's been so many years since I read it, but there's, there's some sort of physiological connection that is created when you make eye contact with someone and smile at them that has like, it, it is a physiological response that, that can release positive, like it, it is a physiological response similar to, to giving someone a hug, but without all the, the weird, mushy, gushy stuff, right? So if someone yeah, doesn't- Yeah, ignoring like their name. Or, or, or their name, right? <laughs> if you don't like physical contact, if you don't like hugging, right, you don't have to hug. You can smile and make, like you can, you can release those same endorphins. You can, you can create that same positive energy with eye contact and a smile. Like it doesn't cost you anything. There's no money involved. There's no money changing hands. No germs changing hands. It's, it's, uh, and it doesn't take effort either. Oh, oh, it's really, really lovely. I love this part. Say hello to a stranger. This is nice. Okay. So a lot of people wind up going to, and we're starting them up again, right? Networking events where you go and you have to meet people or you go to chapter events. If you're in an industry that has a professional association, you go to a, a chapter event or a club event, and it is tempting to sit down at the same table with the friends, right? We go, cause we want to mm -hmm. build on those relationships. We want to, I see Anne across the room. So I go and I see Anne and you're saying, wait, hang on a second. Also say hello to a stranger. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. The other people at the table or the table that you wouldn't have ordinarily sat at because everyone has a story and it's through those connections that you find comfort in yourself. And because it's a small world out there, there's a really good chance you're going to see that person again at the bank or you're going to see him at the gas station or, or at the grocery store. And it's just good for your soul. Sure. Love it. All right. So for our listeners, if you are just joining in, you got to go back and uh, rewind because you got to hear this. This is great stuff. We are here with Ann Stow and we're talking about five tips for making new connections. And we started with going to an event of some sort, like a concert or a sporting event and saying hello to a stranger. And we're on to number three, which is how just a really, really great thing. We should volunteer. And yes, tell us more about this one. Volunteering is a great way to make connections with people. And it doesn't matter what you volunteer for, just do it. So <laughs> I know everybody's busy. Everybody says that. I'm too busy. I'm too busy. I'm too busy too. But here I am today giving just a tiny piece of myself to, to you, Seneca, and to your clear next step because I have a connection with you. And I appreciate you and you inspire me. So I hope you make a connection with her two audience members, if you haven't already. But volunteering, by volunteering, you'll meet people that you will see again. It could be in a job interview, a workshop, or walking your dog. Anyway, volunteering helps you make the connections that you need to sustain your humanity. What a deep thought for, for today, sustain your humanity. It doesn't have to be that deep, but we talked on the Say Hello to a Stranger about the the good chemical releases the dopamine that gets released when you do connect with people. But volunteering is an excellent way to do it. And it doesn't matter how difficult or, or easy it is, whether it's at the dog shelter or for your professional organization. Just do it. Just do it. Just, just get involved. Just volunteer. Just show up. 
I, I'm thinking about the, the, the countless number of wonderful relationships that I have in my life right now, because we volunteered alongside each other mm-hmm. for even, for even a minute, like even whether it was a one day event or a, a one hour event, or we happened to show up at the same, at the same time to, to, I don't know, count tickets or collect tickets at a, at a kid's game or concert or whatever we were doing. It's man, just volunteer. You can build relationships and make connections and make the world a better place. Yeah. I love it. Love it. Okay. Now your next one, you, you're going to have to, you're going to have to help me with this one. <laughs> you have sing karaoke on here and you, <laughs> okay, you got to unpack this one. Oh my God gosh, what a crazy way to make connection, but it's also a really good one. So yes, I sing karaoke. I have a few songs that I do pretty well and others that I don't, but but I sing them anyway. And singing is one thing that I do for me. It literally makes me feel better. I I think it's chakra related, or at least someone told me that once. So audience connections you make after singing might be someone saying, you stole my song or wow, that was good. Or even Good try. (laughs) Connecting with the DJ may serve you well when you see them again in another venue. Perhaps they'll remember you and bump you in line. When you share your emotions, you connect with other people. And that, my dear listeners, is what makes the world go round. Oh my goodness gracious. I just can't even. Okay, so what's your of your karaoke? Do you have a do you have a favorite song? I have two that I always open with. And they're both older Reba McIntyre songs. One is called Take It Back. It's kind of a bluesy, fun song. And the other one is Why Haven't I Heard From You, which is also fun. It's bluesy. But the fun part of that song is it talks about connecting with her boyfriend, but with cell phones being prevalent in cars (laughs) and on on airplanes or in the back of a bus. So it's clearly an old enough song that it's way outdated with the modern technology and modern cell phones. So it's kind of fun to sing that, especially for people who haven't heard it because they're like, well, what did she just say? A phone booth? (laughs) A phone booth? What is that? (laughs) That is so funny. So I've only done karaoke maybe a handful of times in my life, but any man of mine. So i Yep. That was a fun one. <laughs> what fun. And uh, Christmas time. There's a, there's a Reba Christmas song that I would do if I were doing Christmas karaoke, but we'll move on. Okay. So <laughs> let's do, we're on to number one, the number one thing you can do to make connections. So we're on five tips for making new connections and listeners. If you are just joining in, you have got to go back to the beginning because we've been here with Ann Stow on five tips for making new connections. We're on to number one and, and just un- unpack this one for this. I know you do this join meetings early and force random chit chat with an attendee. Oh, I love this. Okay. Talk to us all the way through this. Oh yes. This is my favorite one, especially for team building. And you know, the, I do this frequently and sometimes it works out and sometimes it doesn't, but you can do it in person or you can do it remotely and the opportunities are endless. It's kind of like roulette with benefits. So just pick somebody randomly that, that shows up early. Also, that's the best, especially if you don't know them, because then you get to know someone you get, you know, you can talk about the weather. You, maybe you open with, Hey, you know, what's your name? Guess what? My cat dog kid neighbor did the other day. (laughs) Has that happened to you? And so if it's somebody you don't know, of course, there's always the awkward silence, but once you get them talking, they'll remember the positivity of the phone call and it makes it more fun, right? Because work can be boring. And meetings can be boring. But if you provide a little bit of fun or something unexpected right before it starts, it helps people to pay attention better. And you get those good vibes. And when you get to work with that person again, you'll already have some give and take built in so that they respond to your emails faster. They they call you back on the phone faster. They say, yeah, I can do that for you. Yep. I, 
I have got to tell you that I have watched you do this. And I swear to you, I have been in a room and I have watched you have walk over to someone and have some random awkward conversation with some poor innocent bystander who had no idea that they weren't going to be just left alone at this pre moment at, I don't know, it was probably an iPad somewhere or a pre meeting or a breakout session there. It's probably happened three or four times. And I'm, I'm conflating stories here, but someone was sitting by themselves and you walked over to them. It happened more than once. You would walk over to them and you'd start up a conversation and say something like, I'm Anne with your, your trademark enthusiasm. You'd walk up and say, I'm Anne. You're never going to believe what happened here. And you'd tell them this random story about something. Has that ever happened to you? Like I've watched you do this. And then this watching the person on the other end go from, why is this person approaching me? Why are they talking to me? And then watching their shoulders soften and watching kind of a smile creep across their face and watching them just sort of melt into this moment of, oh, I get to have a conversation with an actual real life human. This is all going to be okay. And I've watched you break down barriers this way. And it's part of why I just so delight in you as a human. And it's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. Oh, that that's that's awesome that you've observed that. You know, I I guess I always just think that I have these things in my pocket, and you're right. That's what I do. And uh, you don't have to be an extrovert to do it because I'm not necessarily extroverted either, or even gifted with gab. It's just if you make yourself do it, you're going to get benefits, and those benefits are going to come back in in tenfold. So just, just do it. And you make somebody else's day, even if they look at you for like the first three seconds, like, why are you talking to me? Do I know you? <laughs> no, it doesn't matter. Let's just make this fun. Yes. Yes, you do. You bring out that fun. And don't we all just need, didn't you say that at the beginning? Don't we all just need a little bit more fun in our lives? Yes. And this is <sighs> an easy way to do it. It doesn't cost anything. Oh, it doesn't. It doesn't. So I would guess that somewhere in your early days, because you have said, I've, I've heard you say it, that this is not always easy for you, that making that first move, starting up the conversation, going out when you'd rather stay home, saying hello when it would be easier to not, that these have not always been easy steps for you. So did, did you start with like a, I don't know, four or five go-to questions or a handful of stories or five or six, like, okay, I'm going to try this, or these are my, these are my scripts. These are my scripted questions or my, my lead-ins, or I'm going to try these and I'm going to practice these until they work. Did you start that way? Or if you had a tip for someone who was like, yeah, I really, I, this is really scary for me. And what do I say first? Any first oh try gosh. tips? You know what? I was not that organized. So all I can <laughs> say to that Seneca is embrace your awkwardness. And that's what it came down to is it's okay to be awkward. So when you, when you do approach somebody that you don't, don't know, it's, it's okay. And, and you just start with, hi, I'm Ann. You know, guess what I did today? Guess what that person did? Did you see blah, 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 blah. And I think over time, I found that that works best because the random awkwardness after it instills fear, it brings a smile. Mm, nice. So now you've got me picturing that scene from Back to the Future. You are my density, right? Like that. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's that random awkwardness is just embrace the awkward. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. So, Anne, this would not be the even better podcast if I didn't ask the question, what's making you even better these days? What's making me even better these days? Well, I'm going to say that this podcast, right? Aww. Because I'd never done anything like this before. And it was difficult to, to write all of these things down or, or try and plan out what made sense from, from the five connections and pick the things to talk about. So this has been a great experience for me. And I really appreciate the opportunity to spread some joy and, and uh, maybe share some tips. Other than that, grandkids make me happy and no snow makes me happy. <laughs> my thermometer on my computer says it's 86 degrees. So no, no risk of snow today. That's for sure. <laughs> Oh, and thank you so much. What a joy to have you with us today. I am so grateful. 
Thanks for having me, Seneca. This has been a blast. Likewise, likewise, as I, as I knew it would be. This is so fun. So as a listener, if you are just listening, you need to go back and rewind and get to the beginning and then listen to this for some chuckles and some joy and some tips because there's all kinds of fun in here. And if you want to get a hold of Anne and get to connect with her, you can, of course, reach out to us at Your Clear Next Step. And Anne, if others want to reach out to you, can they find you on LinkedIn? Is that the best way to find you? That is the best way to find me. Yeah. All right. We'll send them to LinkedIn or they can find you and Estelle on LinkedIn. And listeners, thank you for listening in. We're so glad you were here. We hope this has been a great part of your day. Thank you for being part of this. And on behalf of all of us at Your Clear Next Step, we hope the rest of your day is even better. Thank you for tuning in today. The Even Better Podcast will be back with more content soon. But in the meantime, subscribe to our podcast or check out our website at yourclearnextstep.com for more information. See you next episode.